Tonight at 10, we are live in Ukraine, a country at war after a huge Russian military offensive by land, sea and air. The onslaught began just before dawn with a barrage of missiles on multiple targets right across the country. Then, with Russian attack helicopters and fighter jets homing in on the Ukrainian army, Vladimir Putin gave this warning for anyone trying to stand in his way. Whoever tries to interfere with us or threaten our country should know that Russia's response will be immediate and lead to such consequences that have never been experienced in history. In the capital, fearing the worst, some are desperate to leave. Others take shelter while their president calls on the international community to help his country. Putin started a war against Ukraine, against the whole democratic world. He wants to destroy my country. He wants to destroy our country, everything we have built, everything we live for. As the invasion progressed, reports of civilian casualties, but the Ukrainian people remained defiant. I will stand up and go. I will do everything for Ukraine as much as I can, with as much energy as I have. I will always only be on my motherland's side. The Russian advance has been met with universal condemnation and tougher sanctions from the West. Putin is the aggressor. Putin chose this war. And now he and his country will bear the consequences. Putin will stand condemned in the eyes of the world and of history. He will never be able to cleanse the blood of Ukraine from his hands. Tonight, this country is under martial law and a curfew in the capital is in place. What now for Ukraine as Russia begins to tighten its grip? And in the sports, European football's governing body UEFA will meet tomorrow where the decision will be made to remove Russia of the right to host this year's Champions League final. Good evening and welcome to a specially extended BBC News at 10 from the Ukrainian capital Kiev, a country under attack after a huge Russian military offensive by land, sea and air. Fierce fighting is taking place, including in several areas close to here, with Russian forces capturing the disused Chernobyl nuclear power plant to the north of the capital. Many thousands of Ukrainians are seeking shelter or trying to leave the major cities. The authorities here say more than 50 people have been killed and dozens have been wounded. Well, it's been a day of dramatic events. In a televised address at around 6 a.m. in Moscow, President Putin announced what he called a special military operation in the eastern Donbass region, aimed, he said, to create the demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine. It came as missile strikes were reported on a number of military targets. Explosions could be heard in several cities in the east of the country, as well as here in Kiev. Blasts were reported everywhere, with Russia saying it's destroyed more than 70 military targets, including 11 airfields. And following the airstrikes came the land invasion, with Russian tanks and troops advancing. They breached the border in three main directions, from the east, the south and the north, including from Belarus, Russia's longtime ally. Well, with the first of our reports tonight, our international correspondent Ola Girin has the very latest. One of the opening salvos in Russia's war on Ukraine, a missile strike on an airport in the west of the country. In Kyiv today, a frightening new dawn for Europe and Ukraine. This city of three million awoke to sirens and an invasion. Soon, a panicked exodus from the Ukrainian capital as the EU spoke of one of the darkest hours since World War II. 
уже штук 20 пролетело. And darkened skies as Russian attack helicopters targeted a military airport outside Kyiv. Ukraine says several were shot down. The invasion was by air, sea and land. President Putin, who insisted it would never come, warning that no one should try to stop him. Whoever tries to interfere with us or threaten our country should know that Russia's response will be immediate and lead to such consequences that have never been experienced in history. Hours after he spoke, this was the picture in cities across the country. Images from Ukraine's northern and southern borders showed Moscow's forces streaming in. Ukraine's beleaguered president, Volodymyr Zelensky, addressed the nation, dressed for battle. What do we hear today? It's not just rocket explosions, combat and the roar of aircraft. This is the sound of a new Iron Curtain, lowering and closing Russia away from the civilized world. Our national task is to make this curtain not on our territory, but in the homes of Russians. Ukrainians were not safe in their own homes today. Here, the aftermath of a strike on a block of flats in Kharkiv, Ukraine's second city. Missile fragments now on display in the playground. From early morning in eastern Ukraine, we found queues at ATMs. Now there is war, people want cash in their pockets and fear it may run short. Like many here, Natalia is trying to comprehend what has befallen Ukraine, trying to work out how to protect her two-year-old Karina. We're shocked. We're totally shocked. We are afraid for our children, for our families. Are you thinking about trying to move? Where can I go? We don't know where to go. Who will have us? Nobody, nowhere is waiting for us. I, I don't know, I just don't know. More queues at the petrol stations. Many want to be ready for whatever may come, like Andre, who felt the explosions overnight. I heard it clearly. The earth was really shaking. So we got up and now we are waiting for fuel. We will buy some so we can be mobile in case all communications are cut. We have to prepare. What else can we do? In the battle for Ukraine, Russia is controlling the skies. Here, Ukrainian forces respond with small arms fire. They are outgunned and have been suffering losses. We don't know how many. The attack is a projection of Russian strength and Western weakness. Frenzied international diplomacy and the threat of sanctions failed to stop it. This nation is now under sustained assault. A day has changed everything for Ukraine and for security in Europe. Well, within the last few minutes, Clive, we've been hearing the sound of shelling here in the distance. President Putin has been taking territory by force today. He invaded a democratic state which has long desired joining NATO. Now, NATO says the invasion was long planned and carried out in cold blood. And of course, tonight, that other international concern, the confirmation from Ukraine that after a long, hard fight, 
Russian forces have gained control of the Chernobyl nuclear zone and the former power plant. Now, management at the plant say there have been no casualties there, but Ukraine's president has said this amounts to a declaration of war on, Euro on Europe. And people will be wondering tonight, Clive, by the time they wake up tomorrow, how much more of their country will Vladimir Putin be trying to take? OK, Orla, many thanks for that. Orla Gear in there reporting live for us. Well, for many Ukrainians, their worst fears became a reality in the early hours, waking up to the news that their country was being invaded. We've spent the day talking to some of those now having to adjust to life in a war zone. Ukrainian troops burned piles and piles of documents. What they contain, we don't know. But so great is the fear they could fall into Russian hands, they must be destroyed. The enemy is literally at the gates. Not far up the road, Ukrainian armor, in a capital city braced for the worst. And in the traffic jam, in every vehicle on this highway, sit families who for weeks had prayed for peace. This is actually the main road out of the capital. That way is Poland, it's Lviv in the west, and you've got the city there. We've got armoured personnel carriers here, and a whole line of traffic for as far as the eye can see, trying to get out. The nearby petrol station is doing brisk business in an atmosphere of dread. But while some fear for their lives, others will wait for the moment. We want to stay in, in our apartments with our family. We, we don't want to leave and we stay in Kiev. Are you worried though about what's of, going on? Of course we worry because I am wake up like uh, five o'clock in the morning and I listen and until now I don't believe about this situation, but we, we will wait. Beneath the city streets, shelter from the Russian storm. Kyiv's warren of underground train tunnels and now bomb shelters. Alexander is down here with his wife and two-year-old son. I'm very, very scared for my boy, he says. Also biding their time, staying put in an apartment in the heart of the capital are a group of young civil rights activists with dreams for their country. Like Yuri, age 21, convinced Ukraine can prevail over mighty Russia. I say uh, we win. You think you win? Yeah, we win. Ukrainian and Ukrainian army, we win. I believe it. You'll survive this? Yeah. A hopeful assessment, but his friend Artyom isn't so confident. Are you worried for your life? Are you worried about what could happen? Oh, uh, yeah, of course. It's scary because it's a war. A war too close. As we talk, the country's defenders pass by. The hopes of this land, its future, resting on their shoulders. Clive Myrie, BBC News, in Kyiv. Well, what of the view from Russia? The Kremlin says its military operation in Ukraine will last as long as is necessary. President Biden, who announced the action early this morning, denounced the action, warned that any outside interference would lead to an immediate response never previously experienced in history. But there's a sense of shock among some ordinary Russians and protests tonight in Moscow and St. Petersburg. From Moscow, our correspondent Steve Rosenberg has more. There are moments that change the course of history. Would this be one? Russia invaded Ukraine. Its president threatened the West. If anyone tries to stand in our way or even threaten our country, our people, they should know Russia will respond immediately. And this will lead to such consequences, the likes of which you have never experienced in your history. Russian state TV went into overdrive, backing the assault, claiming Ukrainian soldiers were surrendering en masse. A different mood here. 
and one of Russia's last surviving independent papers. To show solidarity with Ukraine, tomorrow's edition will be in Russian and Ukrainian. The paper's editor, Dmitry Muratov, won last year's Nobel Peace Prize. He believes that President Putin has done irreparable damage to his country. Unfortunately, I have to say very bitter words. I think that today, February the 24th, Russia's future was taken away from it. Our peace-loving Russian people will now feel the hatred of the world because we are starting a third world war in the center of Europe. Vladimir Putin comes across now as a leader with an almost messianic idea to force Ukraine back into Moscow's orbit, even if that means war. What the public might think about that doesn't come into it. He seems determined to achieve his goal. The actions of a government can demonize a whole nation. But keep in mind, amongst the public here, there is little support for war with Ukraine. I'm sorry, I'm so shocked. <laughs> I just can't help crying. <laughs> I think that most of Russians don't support this. It's horrible. And why don't they support it? Because uh, it's uh, not our war. It's war Putin, Biden or anyone else, but not our nation. I think the Ukrainian soldiers will surrender, she says, and they should. It's terrible to be at war with Ukraine. In Moscow tonight, hundreds took to the streets. No to war, they chanted. Determined to make their voices heard. But they were silenced. You can arrest people, but you can't force people to support the invasion of a neighboring country. This is not a conflict the Russian public wants. This is the Kremlin's war. And that is the point, isn't it, Steve? What exactly is it Vladimir Putin wants? And is there anything that can stop him? Well, I think Vladimir Putin is fueled by resentment. Resentment at how the Cold War ended with the West declaring victory and Russia losing power and influence and territory. I think he's also motivated by an almost semi-religious belief that Ukraine must be with Russia, must be in Russia's orbit, and that Russia, as a great power, has the right to its own sphere of influence. I also think he feels disdain for the West and for Western leaders. He thinks they are weak and disunited. Now, what can the West do about this? Well, it's very difficult to say, really. I think the Kremlin will have factored in sanctions. The Kremlin will know that America is not going to put boots on the ground, doesn't want to fight in Ukraine. The West does not want a war with Russia. Russia knows that. But I would say this, that if you've been in power for 22 years, as Vladimir Putin has, as either president or prime minister, you start to feel invincible, don't you? You start to feel that you can't put a foot wrong, that you are Teflon. And that's when mistakes start to creep in. And just from speaking to people on the streets and witnessing the strength of feeling against this offensive, I wonder whether this Russian invasion of Ukraine will turn out to be Mr. Putin's fatal error. OK, Steve, many thanks for that. Steve Rosenberg there, live in Moscow. Well, leaders around the world have been expressing their disgust and outrage at the invasion. The EU, which is holding an emergency summit this evening, called it a barbaric attack that threatened the stability of Europe. Boris Johnson said it was an attack on democracy and freedom around the world. And this evening, the US President Joe Biden announced new sanctions on technology exports, banks and individuals, which he said would impose a severe cost on the Russian economy. Our diplomatic correspondent James Landale reports now on the global response. For days, for weeks, Western politicians paid court to Vladimir Putin, doing what they could to pull the Russian leader and his ministers back from the brink. And yet their diplomacy, their deterrence, their phone calls failed. Now the world must face the consequences of this man's defiance. A burden that inevitably falls largely on this man's shoulders. Putin is the aggressor. Putin chose this war. 
And now he and his country will bear the consequences. Today, I'm authorizing additional strong sanctions and new limitations on what can be exported to Russia. This is going to impose severe cost on the Russian economy, both immediately and over time. After consulting G7 partners, the U.S. imposed sanctions on five big Russian banks, including the state-backed Sparebank. It made it harder for Russian firms to do business in foreign currencies, and it curbed Russia's ability to import vital technology. This evening, the French president spoke to Mr Putin from the Elysee Palace and demanded an immediate halt to Moscow's offensive that he said marked a turning point in European history. Le président Poutine n'a pas seulement attaqué l'Ukraine. President Putin has not only attacked Ukraine, he has flouted the sovereignty of Ukraine and caused the most serious attack on peace and stability in Europe for decades. Tonight in Brussels, EU leaders agreed their own package of sanctions, freezing Russian assets, blocking its banks' access to European financial markets, but not, it would seem, curbing any sales of Russian gas. Their aim? To avoid division concern felt particularly by those on the front line. We have to be united around massive sanctions, severe sanctions on Putin, on Russia. We cannot allow to cross another Rubicon for Putin. What's very important is that the sanctions are coordinated, that is, between the European Union, the United States, Canada, Great Britain, Japan, Australia, throughout the democratic world. NATO promised to do even more to reinforce its eastern flanks, but made clear no troops would be sent to Ukraine, which is not a member of the military alliance. The Kremlin's aim is to re-establish its sphere of influence, rip up the global rules that have kept us all safe for decades, and subvert the values that we hold dear. In a recorded statement in Downing Street, Boris Johnson did, however, promise Ukraine more defensive weapons. Ukraine is a country that for decades has enjoyed freedom and democracy and the right to choose its own destiny. We and the world cannot allow that freedom just to be snuffed out. We cannot and will not just look away. Our mission is clear diplomatically, politically, economically, and eventually, militarily. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. The United Nations Security Council met in emergency session to discuss the actions of one of its own. Don't ask me questions when you are speaking. Don't in fact, it's current president, an invasion by this man's country in clear breach of the very purpose of this body. President Putin. Stop your troops from attacking the Ukraine. Give peace a chance. Too many people have already died. But such pleas are now falling on deaf ears, and the people of Ukraine are paying the price. James Landell, BBC News. Tough words there from Boris Johnson. He was speaking in the Commons as he unveiled what he called the most severe package of sanctions Russia had ever seen. Our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, has that story. Conflict on our continent was not, after all, consigned to history. Assumptions of safety in Europe shaken. Our parliament, our prime minister, confronting the politics of war. Prime Minister Johnson. Putin will stand condemned in the eyes of the world and of history. He will never be able to cleanse the blood of Ukraine from his hands. Now we see him for what he is, a blood-stained aggressor who believes in imperial conquest. But how to confront him? The UK is announcing the largest and most severe package of economic sanctions that Russia has ever seen. We will continue on a remorseless mission to squeeze Russia from the global economy piece by piece, day by day and week by week. Note that will not mean British lives being put in harm's way, but a tighter squeeze on sanctions. The hope stopping Russian business swirling through our economy will hurt. 
There are 10 areas of sanctions, including an asset freeze against all major Russian banks and laws to stop the Russian government and firms getting money from the UK financial markets. Sanctions against 100 companies and individuals, oligarchs and backers of Vladimir Putin. Some exports will be suspended. Equipment that can be used by the military, some high-tech and oil refinery goods. And a ban on the Russian airline Aeroflot landing in the UK. Why have you started a war in Europe? Diplomacy seems at an end, though. More shouting than talking, perhaps. The Russian ambassador summoned to see the foreign secretary, unceremoniously booted out of the meeting ten minutes later. Liz Truss telling her counterparts Russia lied to the world. The opposition called in too, but this time for common cause, to share intelligence, our political parties largely in step. Unusual unity. All parties united in condemnation at this dangerous moment of history. But what costs for us? We must prepare ourselves for difficulties here. We will face economic pain as we free Europe from dependence on Russian gas and oil and clean our institutions from money stolen from the Russian people. But the British public have always been willing to make sacrifice to defend democracy on our continent, and we will again. For our politicians, for the Prime Minister, the challenge is so immense. The first political generation in so long to have to grapple with war on our continent like this. And while Ukraine is more than a thousand miles away, this isn't remote. We'll all feel this in the jagged backdrop of what happens round here and in the cost of our everyday living. There may be a price for us all. Unusual evening meetings convened in Whitehall. Ministers grim-faced on the way in, but talking up the scale of the UK action. I'm absolutely confident we'll take the most robust and rigorous action necessary. I think they're one of the most ambitious set of sanctions ever laid against Russia. But government is downbeat about what lies ahead. Bathing Downing Street in the yellow and blue of Ukraine. But symbols and sanctions may not be enough to make Putin stop. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Westminster. In a moment, we'll hear from our Europe editor, Katja Adler, in Brussels, and our North America editor, Sarah Smith, who's in Washington. But first, let's talk to Laura at Westminster. Laura, we heard tough words from the Prime Minister, from uh, Dominic Raab, the Foreign Secretary, but one wonders how the British government believes it can actually affect the way Vladimir Putin is behaving. Well, Clive, two perhaps seemingly contradictory things are true. It is the case that the government really believes that these sanctions will be heavy, they will be painful for Russia, and that they are very significant steps. But it is also the case that they don't believe tonight that they will suddenly put a stop to the terrible scenes that we have seen on our screens and that you've witnessed on the ground today. It's even the case, I'm told, that the Foreign Secretary believes that we may well be in for quite a protracted conflict here, something quite long and drawn out, with Russia in Ukraine for some time, the current Ukrainian government becoming insurgents, really, and meanwhile, Western sanctions strangling the Russian economy over time in a way that ultimately will become unpalatable. But, you know, whatever the prognosis and who tonight would predict any of this with any certainty, two things we know are already the case that we all have to grapple with. Number one, for the government, for all of us, for the public, the order that we've all lived with for many, many years has been profoundly shaken by this. There's no question about that. And second of all, even if you want to look away, this absolutely matters to us here at home, whether that will be the price of petrol at the pump or maybe even the price of a loaf of bread. Boris Johnson and the Cabinet heard what I'm told were described as ominous warnings from advisers this evening about what the next couple of days might bring. And even if it's really important to say the UK has no intention of putting British boots on the ground and British military lives in harm's way, what the next few days, the next few weeks bring really does matter to us all. It matters very much. OK. To you, Katya, in Brussels, EU leaders, they've been meeting tonight. What have they been saying? 
Well, look, Clive, even before this emergency summit, one EU official said to us he thought this was going to be one of the toughest and most emotional summits the EU has ever held. And from what I'm hearing inside there tonight, he absolutely wasn't wrong. There is a conviction in there uh, amongst a number of EU leaders that they feel Russia's aggression in Ukraine is personal, that Vladimir Putin's ultimate aim is to destabilize Europe and change the balance of power. So for former Iron Curtain countries in Central and Eastern Europe, now EU members and NATO members, they feel very exposed. And we had some of their leaders on the way into this meeting expressing anger that tougher sanctions weren't introduced earlier against Russia. But then you have other EU countries pulling in a different direction. Yes, all 27 leaders have signed up to a new expanded sanction package. They want other sanctions against Belarus. Um, but Germany, Italy, so reliant on gas imports and business ties with Russia, uh, they say uh, that they'd like to keep the toughest sanctions for another day. Others accuse them of self-interest. And then you have other countries, neighboring Ukraine, worrying about a new migration crisis in Europe in case Ukrainians try to flee the country. And they've been appealing tonight for solidarity. And uh, to you, Sarah, in Washington, um President Biden, he spoke to the American people tonight. Is there a sense that he believes that American actions could bring an end to the fighting? Or is, is it pie in the sky, in a sense, for him? Well, there is very little hope here that even these sanctions that President Biden described as crushing and devastating are actually going to have any kind of immediate effect. Threatening them in advance did not deter Vladimir Putin and in the White House they accept it will take time before the impact of these economic measures is actually felt in Russia and could do anything to pressure Vladimir Putin. Um, the US has also announced today an extra 7,000 troops going to Europe and that's in addition to thousands they have already sent to Poland, Romania and the Baltic states but that is to bolster those NATO allies who are on Ukraine's borders. There is no intention whatsoever that they will go in to defend Ukraine or that they will engage militarily at all. So um, the US is meeting military aggression with economic actions, deploying economic weapons, and they know that's not likely to have an effect quickly, and that is causing a real sense that this crisis is testing America's place on the world stage, its, its position as a superpower. If the if measures that they're coming up with, that they're announcing behind their defiant words, are unlikely to have any immediate effect. All right, we'll leave it there. Sarah Smith live in Washington, Katya Adler in Brussels, and our political editor, Laura Koonsberg at Westminster. Many thanks to you all. Well, Russia has one of the globe's largest armed forces, and there are questions as to how the Ukrainians here will be able to defend themselves on their own against one of the most powerful armies in the world. Our defence correspondent, Jonathan Beale, has this assessment, a warning. His report contains some flashing images. Early this morning came the Russian version of shock and awe. Images that a worried world is watching. Russia using its formidable arsenal, rockets and cruise missiles, it's said to target Ukraine's military defences. Russia's launched strikes right across the country, including near the capital, Kiev, its main port of Odessa, as well as Kharkiv. Strikes have been followed up by military units crossing the border. Russian forces are reported to have entered Ukraine from Belarus in the north, from Russia itself in the east, and from Crimea in the south, which Russia invaded in 2014. Western intelligence already assessed that Russia had massed up to 190,000 troops on Ukraine's border. That's slightly less than Ukraine's entire armed forces of around 200,000. But Russia has more advanced weapons. It has long-range crews and ballistic missiles and some of the world's most sophisticated air defence systems. Russia's key advantage is in the air. It has around 300 combat aircraft, including fighter jets and attack helicopters on the border. Ukraine has just over 100. They will very quickly gain air superiority. As soon as they do, the over 200,000 Ukrainian troops stop being an army that can manoeuvre and reposition itself to fight whichever axes uh, the Russians advance on, and instead becomes uh, a collection of independent units that will struggle to reposition themselves without coming under air attack. And so that's where 
the Ukrainians face very hard choices. There are reports of heavy fighting on the line of contact in the east, where Ukrainian forces have been defending against Russian-backed separatists for the past eight years. But tonight, British military intelligence says there's been no sign of a Russian breakthrough there yet. It's where many of Ukraine's best trained and best equipped forces are dug in. Some Western officials fear they could be encircled. The US and Britain are among the few countries that have supplied Ukraine with weapons. But these are mostly short-range anti-tank and surface-to-air missiles. Their best chance may be to defend key cities. Kiev is, is a central objective. Its political significance is as the seat of the Ukrainian government. Uh, Russia must be seen to capture it and must physically remove the Ukrainian government and neutralize its institutions. And it's hard to see how it can do that without capturing Kiev. So I think the defense of Kiev is vital to the position of the Ukraine, Ukrainian forces. The key question is whether President Putin will achieve his political objectives through military means. And how long can Ukraine hold out on its own? Jonathan Beale, BBC News. Oil prices surged to their highest level in seven years as a result of the military action here in Ukraine. UK wholesale gas prices also rose sharply today, up by 60% at one point, which will push up heating bills even further. While the UK gets very little of its oil and gas from Russia directly, Europe does, and as the West uses the economy as its main response to Vladimir Putin, our economics editor Faisal Islam looks at whether we will all pay a price. The economy is an important battleground here, the key weapon for the West against Putin's Russia, and it's also the way in which these huge events will most clearly affect households across the UK. You can see the profound impact of this invasion on the world economy in today's global markets. A barrel of crude oil already above $100 for the first time in seven years. That will filter into petrol prices, which on average are at a record of £1.50 a litre, could push them up a further 10 or 20 pence. On the gas market, the international price up 60%, £3.50 a therm, Household energy bills already going up right now by a record. If this conflict lasts weeks or months, that could happen again in the winter. And that's not the end of it. Food prices too stand to be affected. The conflict is likely to interrupt the supply of grain from Ukraine, which is responsible for an eighth of world supplies. But the economy is also a weapon here, the impact already being felt on the Russian currency down to a record low against the dollar, with the Russians having to prop up the ruble using some of its war chest of over $600 billion in currency and gold reserves. The Russian stock market crashed this morning, losing up to 40% of its value as its main banks and energy giant Gazprom at one point halved in value. But Russian gas supplies, including through Ukraine, continued uninterrupted. Quite literally, dollars, euros and pounds are flowing into the Kremlin and companies it controls selling its main exports as the Western world decries what Russia is doing with that funding. So there's no embargo on Russian energy exports like there was for Saddam Hussein's Iraq when he invaded Kuwait 30 years ago. Serious sanctions that could cripple the Russian economy would also have a painful and material impact on Britain, on the rest of Europe, politically, economically and socially. Today's tranche of sanctions did up the ante, targeting Russia's second biggest bank, VTB, its major airline, Aeroflot, more oligarchs, but without the international agreement needed on the very hardest measures. Faisal Islam, BBC News. More than 100 pro-Ukraine supporters gathered outside Downing Street to protest against Russia's invasion. So how do the thousands of Ukrainians living in the UK feel about the events of this fateful day? Our special correspondent Lucy Manning has been to meet those watching anxiously from afar. They are more than one and a half thousand miles away, but the invasion feels so close. Denis Ugrin is a child psychiatrist. Tetiana Vitviska is a volunteer. Both have parents in Ukraine. 
was talking to them this morning. I wanted to convince my mom to, to leave, leave and go to Poland. But, this, but despite the fact that she is not terribly healthy at the moment, she refuses to go. What more do you want the British government to do? I think people need to understand that this is not 1938. This is 1939. And the entirety of the global peace is at peril. Dennis is able to contact his father. He's clear what he wants from the UK. More weapons. How can they help you? Weapon. Are you are you are you afraid? Are you afraid in Lviv? No, no, no. In Lviv, people is not afraid. Tetiana manages to contact her partner Volod's parents. They have just managed to get a bus out of Ukraine to get across the border to Poland. London, we said we are going to London, Irina tells her. They said there was room on the bus for only one of us, she says, but I begged them to allow us both to go. Tatiana is overwhelmed with anxiety about her own parents. Last week, her dad stood with protesters in London. Her parents only returned home yesterday. Uh, I can uh, contact with, with them. It is terrible because I'm bored and uh, I am sad. Minutes but later, she received distressing head. news. Her and, friend um, had been killed on the first day of fighting. Uh, my friends died. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I'm so sorry. And um, I was scared very well because um, it, is, it is near parents' home. Tonight, she finally managed to speak to them. In a day, their freedom gone and trapped in a war. Lucy Manning, BBC News. Russia has long been resisting Ukraine's shift towards the European Union, but President Putin's sense of grievance goes back to the collapse of the Soviet Union and even further to Russia's historical loss of territory and power. Our World Affairs editor John Simpson looks at what is motivating the Russian leader. It's hard to avoid the feeling that the world as we've known it since the Berlin Wall came down in 1989 has changed for good. The Soviet Empire in Europe was finished and Western notions of freedom had triumphed. After almost two more years, the revolution had reached Russia itself. But after a hapless coup attempt by the KGB, Boris Yeltsin emerged as the man who would dismantle the old Soviet system and introduce much greater democracy. Yeltsin's eventual successor was an ex-KGB officer, Vladimir Putin. He always insisted he didn't want to revive the old Soviet Union, and he seemed to fit in well with the diplomatic niceties of a world which was now dominated by the United States. Yet all the time he was quietly rebuilding Russia's armed forces, which had fallen into decay. Putin was on a mission to make Russia a superpower again. Western leaders, though, just saw him as someone they could do business with. The problem is, that they approach Russia with optimism and thinking that Russia can be engaged with like a Western liberal democracy, not realizing just how rapidly Russia is retreating back into its own historical comfort zone of hostility, not only to the outside world, but to its own population and to its own very specific view of history where it nurses grievances that are just unrecognizable to the outside world. Ukraine especially seemed to obsess him. He hated the way it had gone for independence when the Soviet Union collapsed. Pro-democracy Orange Revolution was an affront to him. By 2014, he infiltrated his soldiers into Crimea, which belonged to Ukraine, and completely contrary to international law, he just took it over. Western countries. A few months later, at a press conference in Moscow, I offered him the opportunity to say he didn't want a new Cold War. 
but he pointedly refused to say that. It's all about protecting our independence, our sovereignty and our right to exist. And yet the West still carried on doing business with Vladimir Putin as though he was just like any other leader. It was a classic case of self-deception. Putin's big supporter now is China under Xi Jinping. No condemnation over Ukraine from Mr. Xi. Suddenly, the world has changed. We're in new territory now, and it looks distinctly like Cold War Mark II. John Simpson, BBC News. All week we've been getting the perspective of, of our chief international correspondent, Lise Doucette, and I'm pleased to say she's here with me now. I suppose the big question is, what now? I mean, where do we go from here after this incredible day? Clive, and maybe not the time to be quoting Lenin, but I can't help but think of his famous phrase that there are decades when nothing happens and there are weeks when decades happen. And this week started with President Putin quoting Lenin in saying that that Ukraine was a fake country created by Lenin. And this, here we have it, a week in which a member of the UN Security Council invades a country while they're presiding over a Security Council. And what we are seeing, this unprecedented resolve and coordination of sanctions uh, by Western nations, and even that is not enough to change President Putin's mind. And more than anything else, tonight is a night, Clive, in Europe, where just behind you, thousands of Ukrainians are spending the night in the underground and in bomb shelters, and they're thinking the unthinkable. We all thought it was the unthinkable that Russian forces could be on their way to Kiev tomorrow. All right. Least thank you. Least do set there. That is it from Kiev on what has been a turbulent and frankly terrifying day for Ukraine and its people and the beginning of a dark and uncertain future for Europe and the world. There will be more reaction on Question Time with Fiona in a few minutes, but now on BBC One. Time for the news where you are. Have a very good night. <laughs>